from a business perspective, one um, aspect is that we, we've sold our gas turbine energy business to Siemens recently. Uh, so as a company, uh, our activity in power generation is now civil nuclear power, where we have quite a large activity in the UK and France and America. Um, and also we make reciprocating engines, which are used in the power generation market as well. Um, you know, we see um, the future of, uh, of power generation, um, assuming that uh, governments globally want to really tackle climate change uh, as needing to be a mix uh, of some renewables w in the form of intermittent renewables such as wind and tidal uh, and wave perhaps, um, but with an increasing baseload of nuclear power. Um, it's our firm belief as a company uh, the nuclear power must play um, an increasing and rapid role in decarbonising uh, power generation for the built environment. Um, and we are um, pushing the case for nuclear power globally. In fact, I myself appeared yesterday in front of the UK Houses of Parliament Energy and Climate Change Committee um, to tell them about um, small modular reactors, uh, which is one of the technological advances that are being made uh, to make nuclear power more affordable and more accessible. The United Kingdom, for example, um, is quite a small island with uh, nearly 70 million people um, uh, consuming about um, 40 gigawatts of electricity. Uh, and uh, for the United Kingdom, it makes sense to have a completely connected grid um, where distributed power generation um, is, is really best done uh, through large power stations that can all be switched on or switched off to a common grid. But if we switch to um, a larger country, and India I would, uh, um, I, I, would, I would definitely name as a larger company, a country, um, it might make more sense to have a mixture of a grid infrastructure in the big towns, but distributed power generation um, in more remote sites. And for example, we've been working on the technology of uh, smartly connecting diesel engines into smart grids uh, so that diesel engines, and when I say diesel engines, I mean engines that could burn diesel but also could burn, for example, syngas from waste gasification plants. Um, and they can be switched on or switched off to, sweet, to, to, suit, uh, to suit loads. That's, that's exactly right. Um, so we're hoping certainly to sell our reciprocating engines into the growing need uh, for distributed power. The nuclear industry um, is a very conservative and very safety conscious industry. Um, and um, much in the way that our aviation customers expect perfection in the products, they don't expect the products to go wrong, they expect them to work every time. Um, so the nuclear industry expects the same. So we constantly, we constantly scrutinize uh, research into the material science behind the safety case, for example, of, of nuclear, uh, nuclear power. Um, and we constantly work across the industry to make sure we make nuclear power safer and safer and safer. Is it ever going to be absolutely safe? Well, nothing in life is absolute. Um, but it's our belief um, that the safety of nuclear power um, is, is, is good enough um, and certainly compared with the damage being done by CO2 emissions, uh, we believe that we should push ahead with nuclear power build as soon as possible. Look, the liability law is a government to government thing and I think the governments have to resolve it. And we, we work within the confines of what the different laws and applicable laws are globally. Right? And the second thing we have to think about beyond the liability law is also the export control laws. Right? I think these are the two steps that have to be taken for nuclear industry to start evolving in India, right? So the simple answer there is basically we have to work within the confines of what the two governments agree with each other, right? And I think uh, we are waiting for that agreement to come through, whether it's with France or whether it's with UK or whether it's with US, I think uh, that clarity has to come through. You know, without going into the very specifics of things, I mean, if you look at it, whatever concerns every company has, it's the same concerns we will have as well, right? I mean, it's the liability law in its current form with the cap and without any firm restriction on what should be done, what cannot be done, where the liability lies. I think those are all things that all companies have that they're trying to resolve and we fall within the same framework of concerns, right? But I think what is very important to note here is that 
It is not what Rolls Royce wants. It's what the industry wants. It's what the governments want to do. Yeah. And we have to just fall within a framework which says we can operate in that framework. And today the framework that is there is not suitable for many of the companies to work. That's why you don't see the nuclear industry developing today. Right? But I think all this will be worked out and what I am, I'm hearing very positive uh, notes in that regard about you know, the current government wanting to figure out ways to solve these issues. Yeah. And I'm sure that we will participate in the process and I'm sure that once the process is completed, will participate in the industry as well. Rolls-Royce has, has for many years been um, ahead of the game um, in monitoring all of our products in service. These are our large civil aero products in service um, and getting a real-time feed um, from uh, the engines that are flying around on their condition. Um, and that is part of us being able to um, offer um, a guarantee um, for the um, propulsion availability uh, across our customers' fleets. So we offer what's called a total care package, uh, which is effectively an underwriting package to make sure um, that our products uh, remain um, sort of available um, to our customers at all times. And that relies on technology, which is health monitoring technology, and data analytics and big data systems, and increasingly the use of um, uh, modern communications techniques such as high bandwidth satellite links in order to um, uh, move all that information back to our operation centres. And it's been a very successful operation and one that we continue to um, develop. In fact, we've recently formed a new business that we've called Rolls-Royce Controls and Data Services um, where we've amalgamated all of our activities in uh, sensors communications and the big data analytics that looks at the sensor streams from all of the engines currently flying uh, in order to post um, service bulletins or service notices um, in real time back to our um, field service operations and that's been very successful. Um, in terms of the technology that goes into the products like the materials um, you know we often get asked what's the next killer um, technology and the answer is the same. It's not one thing. Um, we've been uh, investing uh, and we invest a, a significant sum of money every year in all of the research and technology to make sure our products stay ahead of the competition. And that involves a collection of technologies, some in the material science area, some in electrical systems area, uh, some um, in simply understanding using high performance computing how the products are um, uh, how the products um, are performing from an analytical perspective before we actually design the products for real. Um, and the net result has been that we've been able to improve the uh, fuel efficiency of our products at about the rate of 1% a year for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. we, we were delighted early this year to be able to announce um, two new products to follow on from our Trent family of engines because we felt it was time that our customers and our stakeholders were aware of what we were doing leading into the future um, and we've announced um, our uh, advanced architecture um, which is a, um, uh, a re-architecting of our three shaft architecture um, in the light of our, uh, our modern understanding of how the products work because of better analytics and high performance computing um, and then we've announced an ultra fan architecture which will go on after that about five years following the um, advanced architecture which will take the fuel burn yet into a new league mm -hmm. of efficiency. So we've tried to give people some visibility uh, of um, um, our, uh, our, our future technology plans, but obviously not the details of what we're spending our money on within that sphere. We have an open innovation um, um, activity um, which we've tailored to suit Rolls-Royce needs. Um, so, you know, crowdsourcing is a sort of a general term and um, uh, we found um, general crowdsourcing po possibly not quite as suited to our business as our form of open innovation. Um, we launched a very successful open innovation uh, initiative here in India last year. Um, we've been delighted by the results. Um, it wasn't crowdsourcing in that sense, but it was true open innovation in the sense that we made open to a group of companies um, who agreed to uh, work with us um, a series of challenges. We didn't want to make these challenges public. These are real challenges we face as a business, and so we had to reveal the challenges um, to these Indian companies under um, NDA. We then invited them to give us some creative responses to those challenges 
Um, and um, I have to say the whole process has gone very well. We've been delighted by the innovative and creative input we've had from Indian companies. Um, it's exceeded expectations. So we're going to be relaunching it um, sometime mm -hmm. later this year. We're still in a, a, a commercial dialogue with the companies um, concerned. Um, you know, some of these challenges, these Indian companies may end up forming part of our supply chain. So we need to make sure there's a robust arrangement between us and them. Um, and it's true that we're learning lessons. You know, the, the open innovation pilot we did last year was a pilot because mm. we weren't quite certain whether we were going to succeed or not. Uh, we weren't quite certain whether the terms and conditions that we laid down were suitable. So we've now learnt lessons and next time around we hope to go faster and with more challenges. It's like most things in life you learn. Uh, you, know, you learn from doing something and then you get better the next time. Well, any background intellectual property, in other words, anyone that com comes to us where you know, uh, they are offering us um, something based on their intellectual property, that remains their intellectual property. So unless we have a commercial deal with them that, that buys that property from them, it's their property. We look at big data in, in, in three different areas within our company, and we've been looking very closely uh, at how we maximize the value from data. Now those three steps are um, uh, in analysis and test. So when we're looking at um, uh, massive data sets that are created by simulating our products, um, and the massive data sets that are created by testing our products, how can we use big data techniques for making sure that what we test and what we've analysed correlate? Um, and we've been working with some big IT providers to do that. We set up our own data analytics um, laboratory in Singapore um, to help um, our own activities in that area. The second is in manufacturing, and it might surprise some of your uh, readers um, to learn that some of the biggest data sets we generate are manufacturing data sets. Uh, and I'll give you a data point, which is that um, one of our uh, wide cord hollow titanium fan blades, so these are the, the, the blades at the front of one of our big engines, um, the manufacturing data pack generates half a terabyte of information per fan blade, um, and we produce 6,000 fan blades a year. Um, in one of our factories, um, and that means we're generating uh, three petabytes of manufacturing data just on the fan blades. Uh, so you can see that we are a big data company uh, having to manage massive data sets um, already. Um, and once again, we're deploying big data analytics on the manufacturing data to look at um, um, a number of things. I'm not going to go into the detail of that one because there's some commercial um, uh, advantages that we think we're going to get from the particular approach we're taking but we're very pleased to say we can pull out some quite interesting and usable and actionable information from that data. Um, interestingly the highest value data is some of the smallest volumes of data uh, and that is in the aftermarket so I've mentioned before uh, in the course of our discussion uh, that we monitor all of our products in service, all of our aerospace uh, products in service, um, sorry to, to, to um, to caveat that, it's all of our Trent engines um, are monitored continuously um, as they're flying um, uh, and the monitoring data plus the service data when the engines land amounts to about 40 gigabytes a day of data. This is all collected and then analysed both in real time, so-called hot data, and in non-real time, so-called cold data, to start pulling out all sorts of information uh, such as the need to, for example, bring a service forward on an engine, or perhaps wear data, the need for a jet wash on an engine, um, or perhaps how an engine's performing compared with how we designed it to perform. You know, we're becoming more and more an information-centric company um, and are deploying some quite um, serious big data techniques in making sure we extract maximum value from the information that we, um, we store. Most of the airline data, actually the data belongs to the airlines, and so yes, we do end up sharing it back with the airline, um, but some, some, of the, some of our customers are content that we use it uh, for managing our own um, uh, service and overhaul operations. The closing words from me are really to, if you're prepared to carry this, a thank you uh, through your publication to those um, uh, Indian companies that participated in our um, open innovation event in India. Um, it was done with great spirit. We were delighted uh, um, by um, the ideas that we got back from it. 
Um, I think they definitely exceeded expectations and showed that India is uh, uh, not only a very sort of um, uh, productive and growing economy, but also an innovative one as well. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks so much.